Hello and welcome back to CST3130. Uh, so in this lecture I'm going to talk about web scraping with Selenium. Um, so I've already had a, a lecture on uh, web scraping with JSOUP. Now JSOUP's great um, when you're pulling an HTML page uh, back from the server that has all the data already in it. But in many cases, with sort of modern JavaScript frameworks, you're going to pull back a sort of very almost empty uh, HTML page and then the data is going to be put inside the HTML by JavaScript that maybe pulls it from the server, yeah? So in those cases, you need to execute the JavaScript before you extract the data from the page. And that's why, and in these sort of situations, uh, you need a tool like Selenium. Okay, so let's sort of explain the problem first, yeah? So roughly speaking, um, we can build websites in two different ways, yeah? So as I said, uh, many cases, particularly with the older, older websites, um, the server sends, sorry, the client, you know, the browser, sends a HTTP GET request to the server. The server will then execute something like a PHP script. Uh, the PHP script will then load stuff from the data, load stuff from the database, uh, wrap the data from the database in HTML tags, and then it'll send back an HTML page, possibly with some CSS and JavaScript in it, uh, back to the client. And the HTML tags in that page sent back from the server, um, that'll contain the data that you actually want if you're scraping the page, yeah? So that's, uh, that's the case with PHP most of the time, and also some modern JavaScript frameworks, not so familiar with them, but what they have is a sort of render thing where you can kind of have a template, and then there's a sort of render function that sort of puts the data inside the HTML template, and then sends back the HTML formatted data back to the client, yeah? So in those sort of situations, JSOOP's great, yeah? But there's another sort of type of website. Uh, again, we're talking roughly here, yeah? But uh, with these kinds of websites, the server sends a very sort of basic HTML page. Might have almost no HTML at all, but it will have a bunch of JavaScript. And then what happens when the page loads in the browser is that the JavaScript executes. Maybe it'll send a fetch or XML HTTP request to the server, pull back a sort of uh, JSON uh, structure, which will then load or insert into the page, yeah? So a lot of uh, modern JavaScript will use this kind of approach. So in my later lecture on Vue in this course, I explain how you can have Vue has a sort of data structure, and then it has sort of rules for rendering that data structure in the view, uh, into the HTML, sorry. And so when you're using Vue, you can just sort of ping the server, get a JSON formatted data uh, structure with the latest data, put it into the Vue data structure, and then Vue will automatically sort of render that into the page for you. So if you're using Vue or a similar type of framework, or even your own kind of uh, sort of hand-coded rendering approach, um, then that's going to create problems for web scraping, because the HTML that you pull from the server will not have the data in it, and you need to execute the JavaScript first, yeah? So let's show a little bit of an example, yeah? So I sort of put together sort of a couple of very simple web pages just to show you what I mean here, yeah? So here, suppose we're doing uh, scraping of fish prices, yeah? So we've got, you know, cod, bass, and mackerel. And the price, and we want to do a fish comparison website, let's say, yeah? So this is, might be a sort of traditional sort of HTML file that's sent back from a PHP, from a website that's sort of run using PHP. And we can see here in this HTML, we've got cod, bass, and mackerel, and the prices. And this, this could be dynamically generated from data from a database, but what all the client will ever see is an HTML uh, uh, file or page or whatever that looks a bit like this, yeah? And so when you see the sort of front end, it'll look fish for sale, and these are the various prices, yeah? And, but this is a sort of, sort of more modern website approach, right? Where you have the HTML itself is very basic. Uh, maybe you've got an empty div, or maybe not even that, because JavaScript could even insert that into the page. And then when the window loads, it'll trigger this function here. And it's going to call, uh, contact the server. In this case, I'm just loading the data from a static file called fish.json, just for because example. But typically, um, this would be like a RESTful web service as you're going to build uh, as part of your first bit of coursework, whereby the server would then load a bunch of data, extract a bunch of data from the database, wrap it up in JSON, and then send it back to the client. Yeah. So in this case, it's a simple static example, but this would usually be dynamic. Yeah. So the JavaScript running in the browser is then fetching this JSON structure from the server. And then it's inserting into the page, just like you did last year with kind of coursework one and possibly coursework three as well, yeah? And then, so we see the page that, as we see it, um, looks exactly the same, yeah? So I've, I've put together, I can run these examples for you if you like, um, just sort of how we see them. So here we've got the, the two web pages. This is the static one. You can see it's just running off, uh, you know, off the file system. This one's running off a server, because otherwise I'm going to get cross-origin request errors. Um, and so if we have a look at uh, what's sort of behind the scenes, so to speak, 
Now, if we're doing web scraping, right, the first thing we're going to do is open up developer tools and start to have a sort of rummage around, seeing where we can get the data, yeah? And so as we sort of select the different elements here, maybe we're looking for the price of COD or whatever, then we can see here in the HTML that's actually in the page, that's what we're looking at here, um, we can see that all the data is present, and so, you know, we think, hey, we can maybe scrape that. But then if we look at the uh, sources here, uh, and if we look at the sources, in the case of this page, um, obviously we can actually see the sources as well. Yeah, we've got here in the HTML source, we've got the COD, BAS, and MACRO, yeah? Now, if we look at our dynamic page, it looks much the same. I haven't bothered making them look absolutely identical. And again, if we do the inspection sort of thing here, we can see that in the HTML that's actually in the actual page, corresponding to the current document object model, um, we can see that we've got all the fish listings and the bass and the prices. So we might think, hey ho, this can be dead easy to scrape, right? All we have to do is just run JSOUP and scrape the HTML. But again, in here, it's different, right? Because as I showed you, um, the actual HTML has almost nothing in it. We just got an empty div uh, and a bunch of JavaScript, yeah? So JSOUP is not going to be able to scrape this website, um, whereas it would find it very easy to scrape this website. Okay, so... As I sort of explained already, JSIP is a good scraping tool when you're just getting data back in, that's actually embedded in the HTML sent back from the server. JSIP does not execute JavaScript, so it can't use, be used to scrape websites that dynamically load data using JavaScript. We need something that's actually going to execute the JavaScript for us before we extract the HTML. And this is where the Selenium Java library kind of comes in, yeah? So this is a tool that enables us to automate actions in a browser. So the whole background of Selenium is really around web testing, yeah? So those of you who did my module last year and who did Coursework 3 and who did all the testing in Coursework 3, and not, not so many of you probably, um, would have used Selenium um, and the, the Selenium IDE in this case um, to actually automate actions in the browser. So what, what Selenium is typically used for is to interact with the browser and make assertions about what should happen when you do these these particular interactions. Yeah, so it's like a testing tool. So you might use for less, so, so suppose I had a company website that was like uh, critical to the success of my company, like an e-commerce website. I might write some automatic tests in Selenium and I'd run those tests every minute, let's say. And if any of them broke, then I'd know that my live website was broken and that I should uh, you know immediately contact the you know the engineers to kind of try and sort it out. Yeah. So it's great for testing of websites in a sort of uh, in a sort of developmental stage, but also at, at the production stage. Yeah, to sort of monitor your website live and make sure the login functionality is working, for example. So last year we covered the IDE plugin that lets you record sort of you know you press record and then you interact with the website and it records what you're doing and then you can turn that into a test and add the assertions and all that stuff. Yeah. So that's the sort of one tool people use that's part of the sort of Selenium suite, I suppose you might call it. Um, but you've also got, um, which is much more powerful and much more interesting in a way, the Selenium Java library that, look, that does everything the IDE does, but lots more, yeah? In particular, you can write your te uh, web tests in code, and you can also use Selenium with the Java library to actually uh, extract data um, as part of web scraping. So that's the IDE, which some of you used last year, um, where you sort of interact with, you press the record button, interact, and it records what you're doing, and then you can add like assertions to check that what you expect to happen is actually happening. And then we've got the Java library, which I'm covering in this talk, um, which lets you write code that does the same thing. You write code that will load the browser, load up a website in the browser, and then interact with that website. So as I said, the background Selenium like Java library is testing, but it's also a very useful tool for web scraping. So as I said, we can write code that launches the browser, interacts with the page, extracts from the, H and it, mo most crucially, that's why I'm recording this whole talk, extracts HTML from the page after the JavaScript is run. So we can use the Selenium Java library to scrape data from dynamic websites that require the execute, execution of JavaScript and user interactions. So suppose I want to scrape uh, data from a website that in, wants me to kind of press on a button or, you know, uh, yeah, let's say, you know, even do some kind of complicated, you know, stuff with a mouse or something like that, yeah? So I can use the Selenium Java library to do exactly those kinds of, to, to interact with the website in the appropriate way, and then I can get the HTML that results from those interactions. So to install it, it's dead easy. We all, you, I hope you're up, up and running with Maven by now, so you don't have to mess around downloading jar files, just add a nice sort of XML blob um, to, the, uh, to your POM file. Now, the crucial thing with the Selenium Java library, and uh, when you're using the web driver, um, is that it has two modes, yeah? So in the standard mode, um, you can actually see the browser and the website as Selenium interacts with them. So as the code runs, you'll see the browser window pop up, 
and whatever you program Selenium to do, like you sort of click on buttons or enter data in forms and so on and so forth, you'll actually see that happening as Selenium does that stuff, yeah? So that's the standard mode where you actually see the browser window, yeah? In the headless mode, it doesn't launch the browser window at all because Chrome supports running in a headless mode where it's just sort of executing the JavaScript in the background. It's still using the Chrome engine, it's still rendering the DOM, you know, in, as a, into the, in the program, but it's just not visualizing anything, anything that's happening in, as a graphical interface, yeah? So obviously, because it's not using the graphical interface, it's faster. And, and of course, if you want to run the web scraping as a background process, you don't want the sort of browser windows to be popping up left, right, and center. So if you're scraping from five websites using Selenium, it's gonna get pretty messy on your desktop. You're not gonna get much work done if you're constantly popping up browser windows. So you can do it in the background. Of course, if a lot of people do web scraping uh, running in sort of servers in the cloud or something like that. So again, the headless mode makes sense because there's no point trying to launch a graphical window in a server that doesn't have a, 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 a monitor attached to it, yeah? So, what people typically do is they'll uh, use non-headless uh, to debug and test their code, so that because it obviously it's much easier to test that your web scraping is working correctly if you can actually see the browser window and see Selenium interacting with the website. But once you've got it sorted, once you're getting the right data out of your website, you can then switch off the switch off the head, so to speak, turn it, move into non into headless mode, and then just let it run in the background and extract the data. Yeah, that's the typical sort of workflow. Yeah, that's why you can switch between the two. Okay, so Selenium is a, uh, has a Java library. You can use other programming languages as well, but I'm focusing here on the Java library. And to make the Java library work, you need a separate program or executable uh, to actually control the Chrome browser. So Java can't directly control Chrome. It needs a sort of intermediate program that lets it do that, yeah? So you have to install that on your uh, machine to make that work, yeah? So there's, on Windows, I mean, for Mac, the, uh, there's, I've given you a page that shows you installation instructions for Macs and Linux and this kind of stuff. But on Windows, at least, uh, you download the file Chrome driver from the downloads, you put it somewhere sensible, you sort of have to sort of install it yourself, but it's not complicated. So I have a C programs folder to hold all the programs that I'm manually installing. So I created a folder called Chrome driver and just stuck it in there. Then you need to add it to the path. Otherwise your Selenium Java program won't be able to find it. Yeah. Now make sure if you've already got a shell open or if you've already got your IDE open, after you've changed the path, you need to restart the IDE because when the IDE starts, like, you know, um, IntelliJ or something like that, it won't be able to, it'll store the, the path, it'll have the copy of the path as it existed when it was started, yeah? So if you change the path while the IDE is running, you need to restart the IDE to make it reload the path, yeah? Um, and then you're done, yeah? It's not complicated, yeah? So I'll just do a little demo just to show you. So let's just say, so what you do, I think I've given you a link to this anyway, but if we go to just type Chrome driver downloads or whatever, now you need to figure out what version of Chrome you're running. So if you just go to help, uh, help center, not help center, sorry, that's stupid. Okay, help about, uh, about Google Chrome. And here we can see uh, that it's version 85, yeah? So I'm on Google Chrome version 85. So then I would download the version, appropriate version for that. I click on the download page. And then I get the different, uh, the binaries, yeah, the, in this case, the executable for Windows, but it's also for Mac and Linux. So then I could just download the driver there. Okay, uh, let me just get rid of that. Um, and then, uh, as I said, I use, just for my system, C, uh, no, sorry, I use uh, G, I think it is, G programs. Uh, then I've got all the programs that I've installed manually here. And then I've got uh, the Chromium driver folder here, and I just chuck it in there, yeah, dead easy. And then I need to copy the path here. And in Windows, at least, I'm, with Mac, you've got the bash RC thing, but in Windows, you edit, you can edit your environment variables using the, the control panel. So you just type environment, uh, in, uh, I was still spend less something, envir environment. So you just whack in edit system environment variables, click on environment variables there. Now you can edit the user of path, or because I wasn't quite sure, I, I decided to edit the uh, system path, but probably both would work. Um, and so Chromium driver, so you just add create new and then add a new path entry there and then it should have, should have worked, yeah? Okay, so easy to install, but just a couple of, you know, manual steps to make it work, yeah? If it's not on the path, obviously the Java program can't find it and use it. Okay, um, so we've got the driver installed. Um, the Java libraries that we need, the Selenium ones, are going to be installed by Maven for us. So now we're kind of ready to go with our web scraping, yeah? So this is the sort of the steps, right? So we choose, we can set an option for headless browsing if we want it or not. We write some Java code that loads the website in Chrome. 
Then if you're in uh, the standard mode, you'll see the browser load up, um, but even in the non-standard mode, you still have to wait. So you have to pause, and if you're doing a multi-threaded program, that's dead easy, you just go to sleep. Um, and even in a standard program, you can use thread.sleep to go to sleep. So you need to wait because it will take time for the browser window to open, or even if you're not using a browser window, it'll take time for the website to load from the, from the, from the server. Um, and it'll take time for the JavaScript to execute, and then if the JavaScript has to pull additional data, that will also take time. So the wait time is a little bit of a hack, um, in the sense that if you've got a slow system, you have to wait longer. If you've got a slow network connection, you have to wait longer. So you have to sort of try and experiment. Better to be to wait too long than too short, because remember, if you're web scraping for price comparison website, it doesn't matter if your prices are updated every 10 seconds or every 20 seconds or every five minutes or every 10 minutes, right? Because prices don't change that much, yeah? So it's totally fine if you want to wait 10 seconds to be sure. But obviously, if you're doing debugging, it's annoying to have to wait 10 seconds all the time. So find a value that seems to suit you. And if you're going into production, maybe you want to set that a lot longer just to be on the safe side, yeah? So you wait for it to load, wait for the JavaScript to execute. Then you can extract the page source from the current document object model, the one that's been modified by the JavaScript. And then the Selenium WebDriver has some very nice CSS selector tools, just like JSUP has selector tools that will let you pick out different parts of the page. So here's the, you know, the code. So I put the code online for you so you can have a look at it. Um, so let's have a look at the, I'll sort of split it in two parts, make it easier to see. So here we're, we need to use the Chrome Options uh, class uh, to set the headless on and off. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And the web driver is what the Selenium class that actually controls Chrome. And so we have a, so this is like the super class or whatever, and then this is the subclass that's specific to Chrome. Um, and then we use the driver to send a get request to uh, groceries.asda.com search cake. Cake is my example here. Um, I'm picking Asda because I'll explain that Asda is a website you can only scrape with Selenium, you can't scrape it with, uh, you know, with JSOOP. Then we go to sleep. In this case, I found that three seconds works just fine, but you know, more or less also fine. Uh, so it doesn't really matter that much. And then once we've, we've waited, we can then get to the page source. So that's the HTML that corresponds to the current document object model, the one you'd see with inspecting with elements. And then we can use the, uh, the elements, uh, the CSS selectors that are built into Selenium um, to extract the elements that, that we're looking for. In this case, I'm looking for the cake products. Yeah, I'm just showing you how to do cake scraping in this case. And I can just output them to the command line so you can see. And then you should always quit at the end. I haven't tried not quitting, but I suspect that if you run it in headless 20 times, or even in headed mode 20 times, um, you're going to end up with 20 browser windows open, which is a pain, and maybe you're going to have lots of resources sitting around on RAM and not using. So you should always quit the driver, yeah? Okay, so this is probably easy, more easily explained um, through a demo. So I'm going to do quite a long demo to explain how all this works, yeah? Okay, so let's start with the problem, yeah? So I don't need that anymore. So first, um, let's suppose I want to scrape uh, a cake. I'm, I'm doing a cake comparison website. This is the example we've got here, yeah? So we're going to start, obviously, um, by... So I'm going to want to scrape some stuff from groceries.asda.com. So the first thing I want to do is make sure it's legal and it's okay with Asda for me to take that data, yeah? So I've gone to my robots text file. I've had a look here. Um, and they're, they're, they're pretty, you know, they don't like the e-store, privacy policy, part, checkout registration. They don't want me to necessarily buy stuff from Asda online, but they seem to be fine for me to actually search for stuff, yeah? So I go to groceries.asda.com, and I'm going to search for cake, yeah? Because this is like an example with cake. So if you look here, again, just showing you the robots text stuff. So here, the path is search slash cake. It's not banning any of the search paths. So I'm fine with searching on Asda and taking the data that I get as a result of search results, yeah? So as you can see, when we look at the uh, the results here, we've got you know a bunch of cakes, right? As you as you as you'd expect and hope, yeah. So now let's have a little look at the sources. So as you can see, this is a commercial website built by lots of developers over lots of time, and it's nightmarishly complicated. Yeah, we got a whole ton of stuff for tracking, all the rest of it, analytics, and you know heaven knows what else, yeah. And then if we actually click on cake, it doesn't even give us any HTML. So heaven knows why that is, but. You know, we're not going to get very far by looking at the sources um, in the inspector, yeah? But when we're actually trying to, doing our work of trying to find out how to scrape this website, you know, we can actually look at the HTML of the current document object model um, using this elements inspector, and we can sort of click through and see that, you know, co-product double underscore price has the actual price there, for example. And if we wanted to get, you know, the description of the thing, uh, and then we've got a link to the to the product and we've got the description there. Yeah, so obviously the data is there in the HTML as it currently exists. 
Um, but as I'll show you, the data doesn't exist in the HTML that's initially sent from the server, yeah? So we want to get the cake off Asda, so let's just show you the problem first, yeah? So let me uh, just demo the problem and then we'll show you the solution. Because I actually have had a few students who've been trying to scrape Asda and that's partly where this kind of talk came out of, yeah? So obviously this is all set up on uh, uh, IntelliJ Community Edition because it's good. Um, so I've obviously installed, uh, not JSON, well, I've got JSON as well, but I've also got Selenium there in my POM. So IntelliJ is smart, it can handle, it just downloads everything automatically for me because it's a Maven project. So what I'm going to show you first is what happens if we try and scrape the ASDA, that ASDA path for searching for cake, um, just uh, using JSOUP, yeah? So, what, so here we go, just standard stuff, we connect to cake, and send a get request to cake. Um, I'm going to output the HTML so we can have a look, quick look at it. I couldn't find that in the inspector tools, but you know, uh, maybe it's there somewhere. But anyway, it's easier if we have a look at it here. And then I'm doing a selector because it turns out the cakes are all got this uh, CSS selector co-product anchor on it. That's the class that, that marks each of the different cake products. And then I'm going to just output all the cake products that I found, perfectly without breaking my code, um, to, to the command line. Yeah, so you should see cakes from Asda followed by a list of cakes if JSOUP is able to scrape this site. Yeah, let's just check. Yeah, okay, so let's just make, hope this works. Yeah, demo is always a little bit dicey, particularly with live websites. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So first thing to notice, okay, if we look at my output, cakes from Asda, that's my output here at the end after the HTML, and there's nothing there. Yeah. So it hasn't found any cakes in the HTML that's in this is first return from the server. And now if I do find and look for cake, the only cake it can actually find in the HTML is there. Yeah, if we look at this HTML, what we've actually got, and there'll be a bunch of other JavaScript in there as well. We've got a ton of links to other JavaScript files. It's really, if you look at this, it's almost no HTML at all. Yeah, we've got a header. I'm not even sure there's even a body in this thing. Yeah, yeah, we've got this maybe some maybe a bit of a body with some more script in it. What this what Asda is sending us is a skeleton HTML and a huge chunk of JavaScript and links to JavaScript, yeah? It's absolutely got nothing about the product um, in any of this JavaScript, yeah? The JavaScript has to run in order to actually show the data in the, in the page, yeah? And that's the right way to do it, yeah? I mean, I'm all in favor of this way of, um, uh, of running, building websites. It's much more sensible than passing enormous chunks of PHP. If you've ever done eco uh, like online shopping with websites that work the old way, you do a search, and then you sort of refine, um, and then it returns the HTML, which is kind of okay. But then you want to refine it, and then it'll reload the entire page in some really cumbersome way. If you want to do a fast, responsive website, you know, writing most of it in JavaScript is the way to go. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to show you the Selenium code that does pretty much the same thing, the code I've just been through. Yeah. So initially we'll set headless to false. Yeah. So we can see what's going on. Um, and then we're loading up the driver, doing exactly the same thing. Get requests to that URL. Now we're sleeping, three seconds is sort of, will do. Then we, I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna output the HTML from the page after it's loaded. And then I'm gonna repeat exactly the same as I did here. I'm work, I'm doing a selection using the uh, the Selenium selection tools, but they were doing the same thing basically. Uh, the same CSS selector here by class name, and, it and it's gonna output all the cakes here, yeah? And then I'm gonna quit the driver, yeah? So I said, hopefully this will work. Okay, so it started up. Now you can see here it's launched the window, very exciting. Um, it's, it's going to that URL, it's doing a search for cake, it's waiting three seconds, it's telling it's being controlled, whatever, and then it's quitting quitting the browser and closing the browser window, yeah? I always find this rather exciting, yeah? Okay, so now we've got all the HTML that's been returned. You can already see it's a bit different, but I'll go through it in a sec. And then we've also got, at the bottom, we've got our cakes, yeah? So now I'll do a search through the HTML for cake, same as I did before. So that's just sort of uh, echoing the stuff, whatever. If we go down a little bit, uh, that's the, I don't care about the URLs. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, that's, ugh, come on. Right, here we go. So here we actually get the products here and there should be a, da, 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 some kind of anchor thing that I found. I'm not gonna worry too much about this. Code drop down option. There's probably a code, code drop, down, drop down option somewhere. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. You can see here, we've got uh, HTML here in the source HTML that actually has the cake data inside it, yeah? So lots of cake data inside the HTML. Um, uh, I suppose I can't see the product, uh, code product anchor. I think it's there somewhere. It doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so this is the this is the HTML that actually corresponds to what you see in the inspector in in uh, in, in in Chrome, yeah. And obviously it's worked because at the end of the day we've actually got out um, a long list of all the different all the cakes that are on the page, yeah. So this is uh, I don't know why it's not saying cakes. Oh, because I'm got to like here are the cakes bit of code anyway. It's just outputting them, yeah. So here are all the cakes. Whereas in the previous example we didn't have any of the cakes. 
Oh yeah, so I'll show you the headless scraping as well, just to, you know, complete the picture. So that was, you saw the browser run up, up you know, pop up, whatever. Obviously that's a bit rubbish if you're trying to run this thing as a background process, because you see the browser windows popping up as you're trying to answer your emails or whatever. So if we save that, um, we can run it again, and the program will just run. Um, you won't see any browser window, and it'll do its stuff. Just wait our three seconds, and there you can see at the bottom we've, also, we've still got our cakes, same, same as before, just we're not seeing the launch of the browser window. So this is powerful. I hope you can see that controlling uh, websites in Chrome is, is a very powerful tool. I've only shown a basic example where we're loading the page, waiting for it to do something, and then extracting the uh, HTML. But obviously it can do anything that a human can do on a website. Yeah, we can log into website, fill in submit forms, take screenshots, click on parts of the page, and so on and so forth. And you can do this all in, in where you can see the browser, and you can also do it in headless mode. So just to give you an example, if you've got some kind of clever idea, for a sort of final third year project based on this kind of stuff, then you can you, then the Selenium web drive is a powerful tool for that. I had a student a couple of years ago who was doing a sort of um, shopping website, you could say, um, that was, uh, and the idea of this was it would uh, it would select it would do the shop the online shopping uh, for the user, right? So using um, these sort of Selenium web driver, he sort of logged into sort of Tesco shopping, whatever, added a bunch of stuff to the basket and checked out and gave the user the option to do the final checkout. But he did all the basket adding um, using Selenium by sort of clicking on stuff and interacting with the with the um, with the website. Yeah. So he wouldn't have been able to do his project very well unless he'd been able to interact with websites. So if you can think of a project that requires interaction with websites in some way, then Selenium web driver is a very good tool for that. Yeah. Okay, so as usual, um, I've given you the example code that I've shown you here in this lecture, and some links to the sort of Selenium Java doc, how to get the Chrome driver running and all that kind of stuff, yeah. It's pretty clear. Okay, so in this lecture I've explained how you can use Selenium Java libraries to extract data from dynamic websites. Websites where the JavaScript has to run to insert the data into the page before you can extract it for scraping, yeah. But these Selenium Java libraries, their application goes way beyond what I've shown you here. Yeah, they're a very useful testing tool because obviously you can run all these tests just writing by writing Java code. And there's lots of other applications in web development. If you've got something where you need to interact with a web with a website using code, Selenium Java libraries are absolutely fantastic for that. Yeah, and that's it.